risen Christ is with us. Amen. Let's stand together as we give praise to God. I'm Ron Beaton, one of the pastors here, um, along with Pastor Chris, who has just returned from getting him one of them educations, um, and he works on his doctorate degree, and so it's good to have Pastor Chris back with us today. Um, I want to especially welcome today any visitors or guests that we have with us today. We're particularly glad you're here, and if you are a guest, we hope you'll fill out a connect form um, in the attendance pad as it's passed down the row so we can get to know you a little bit better, but we're particularly glad that you're with us today. Um, why don't we spend some time um, in prayer? <laughs> Give us grace, O oh Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to sing. My 
trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Sometimes I wonder if he's faithful. Does he see me in my trouble? Does he understand? Sometimes I question if he's able. Can he rescue? Can he save me again and again? But when I Those voices try to tell me I'm forgotten and I've fallen too far from his hands. But I know what kind of God he is, and I'm trusting in his promises. I'm believing and I'm singing, yes, he can. Did he move every mountain? Did he part every sea? Yes, he So today we are continuing our sermon series, Follow. Um, Jesus calls us to follow him, right? In the scripture today that Pastor Chris read, Jesus directly calls Simon and Andrew, and then he calls James and John to follow him. So this sermon series um, aims to figure out what exactly Jesus means when he says, follow me. Who is this Jesus we are following? And if we follow, where exactly are we going? Why are we following? How do we follow? When do we follow? Do we follow Jesus on Twitter and like to, and subscribe to him on YouTube? Or is it more than that, right? So we spent last Sunday in the Gospel of John. And the focus in the scripture um, shift is the shift from John the Baptist to Jesus and Jesus procuring his first disciples. Today we're going back to Matthew's account and the scripture shifts from John the Baptist to Jesus as he procures his first disciples. So a little overlap there. The scripture begins with John the Baptist being arrested, presumably for his wild preaching about a kingdom of God, which sounds a heck of a lot like uh, sedition, right, to the Romans. 
And then Jesus gets a change of address. Jesus had found a no, new home. No longer was Nazareth going to be his home, but Capernaum by the sea in, Zebul in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. So Matthew tells us that this is to fulfill what was written in the book of Isaiah chapter 9. Land of Zebulun, na land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. Light has dawned. When Isaiah chapter 9 was written, the Hebrew people are separated into two kingdoms, right? Maybe you know this. There's the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, and according to chapter 8 of Isaiah, the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, find themselves in a period of, quote, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. Invaders from the Assyrian Empire have attacked the northern kingdom, shearing away portions of Israel to create these Assyrian provinces, right? And as the Israelite people sit in darkness, in the darkness of cruelty and oppression and violence, Isaiah, the prophet, writes, I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will hope in him. God may be hard to find, but Isaiah waits and hopes for a brighter future, a future with God. And in the midst of all of this turmoil, Isaiah is audacious enough, perhaps faithful enough, to say to these hurting people who were living along the sea, the people of Zebulun and Naphtali, the people who sit in darkness, have seen a great light. And for those who sit in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. And now, hundreds of years later, comes Jesus. Jesus moves into Isaiah's neighborhood. And while the Assyrian Empire is long gone by this point, they find themselves in darkness once again. This time under the thumb of another imperial power, the Roman Empire. Matthew wants us to know that Jesus is the light that has shined. Jesus is the hope for the future in Capernaum. Jesus is the hope for all of Israel. Jesus is the hope for the world. When you think of Capernaum, I encourage you not to think about like Destin or Gulf Shores, right? Um, I want you to think of a small fishing village nearby. Um, what I think of is my first field ed appointment um, when I was in seminary was, at, was in Manio, North Carolina, on Roanoke Island on the Outer Banks of the state. Um, it was a rough summer. Um, it was a beautiful place, right? So Manio was kind of like the, the town that you would come to to shop and eat in once you had gotten sunburned on the beach, right? So you'd take a little day trip to Manio. Um, it was a whole summer of paradise, but it wasn't Manio that reminds me of Capernaum. It's really this town on the southern end of the island called Wanchis, um, a Native American name. Um, it's a beautiful village surrounded by water, but it was not designed for tourists at all. It was designed for people who make money fishing, catching fish. There was a restaurant that I frequented down there, and you could see the boat would pull up, and you'd see the fish coming off the boat that you were about to eat. I mean, it was as fresh as you could get. It was delicious, the best hush puppies in North Carolina. Uh, anyway, the residents had this thick, like, it was known as the Ocracoke Brogue, if you've heard of the, the town of Ocracoke on the Outer Banks. And so it's a dialect that was um, only spoken by the hoi toiters. So like you know, they would say, they would say it's hoi toit on the sound soit at hoi. That was the way they'd talk. It was really strange. Um, but it was this old uh, dialect that had been around since the 1600s. The people there were generous and they were good people, but they were rough and they were salty. Um, that was the spirit of the people I imagine in Capernaum, right? Rough, salty, working class fishermen. This is not a place you take a vacation, 
but a place you go to experience real life. And it's here where Jesus decides to take up residence. So I wonder, I wonder if Jesus, as he's walking along the seashore, if he was thinking about Isaiah, I, as he wondered, did he wonder about Israel's dark and troubled past, about Isaiah waiting for the Lord, as he took long walks along the beach, did he ruminate about, ruminate about the light coming to the darkness? Once Jesus had set up shop, he meanders down, right, to the Sea of Galilee, and he comes across two brothers. So you've got Andrew and you've got Simon. Of course, Simon, we know he's going to get a name change, right, because Jesus doesn't like Simon. He prefers Peter or Rocky. It means rock. Peter means rock. Um, so he comes to Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and the two are fishing. And it's not like Opie and Andy style fishing, right? Um, but it's a fishing for a living. And so Jesus walks up to these complete strangers and he says, follow me. I will make you fish for people. And instantly and wildly and unpredictably, they left their nets and just followed Jesus, which is just crazy to me, right? And then Jesus sees two more brothers who are also fishermen, James and John, <coughs> excuse me, son of Zebedee. And again, Jesus walks right up to the Zebedee and son's fishing business, and he says, hey, follow me. And they're mending their nets, and they just drop their nets, and they get up, and they follow Jesus. Wildly and unpredictably and instantly, they just drop their nets and follow Jesus. It's the darndest thing. Who does that? Who just leaves their business? Who just leaves their security? Who just leaves their home, their family, and just follows a stranger? Why would they do that? Were the sons of Zebedee more likely to follow Jesus because they saw the encounter with Simon and Peter and Andrew? Were the men somehow disgruntled with work? Had they had enough of the fishing life? Was it too difficult of a life? Were the sons of Zebedee disgruntled with, with their father? Was their home life falling apart? Why leave everything and follow Jesus? So I always find it interesting that Jesus went to them and said, follow me. Jesus didn't go preach in the synagogue and then wait for them to come to him. He went to them. He went to their place of business and told, said, hey, come and follow me, which is historically one of the most John Wesley-ish things you could ever do, um, right? So if you've been a Methodist, like, for your whole life, you'll probably know this story that I'm about to tell. So it was the spring of 1739. Um, George Whitfield, who is the famous Methodist preacher, wrote John Wesley, who's the founder of the Methodist movement, wrote him a letter and he said, the crowds that are coming to hear me preach are so great, I need your help. And so John Wesley, the high church Anglican Church of England priest, the wig wearing Oxford Don was horrified at the idea of street preaching, preaching to people um, where they work as opposed to a church. On Thursday, March 29, 1739, John Wesley wrote in his journal, quote, In the evening I reached Bristol, and Mr. Whitfield was there. I could scarcely reconcile myself at first to this strange way of preaching in the fields, of which he set for me an example on Sunday. I had been all of my life till very lately so tenacious of every point relating to decency and order that I would have thought the saving of souls a sin if it had not been done in a church. That was Thursday, okay? And then on Monday, John Wesley writes one of my favorite lines in the history of Methodism. He says, quote, at four in the afternoon, I submitted to be more vile. 
And I proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking to about 3,000 people. The scripture on which I spoke was this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So John Wesley noted that Jesus preached his greatest sermon, not in a synagogue, but in a field, even though there were plenty of synagogues available. From the very beginning of Methodism, we were a go-to religion as opposed to a come-to-us religion, right? In Wesley's day, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, was a very respectable institution. And there was a chasm that was deep and wide between the aristocrats who could be found inside the church, in the pews, and the working class family. John Wesley and the Methodists believed that the Christian faith was for everybody. So they went out to the unchurched. They went to the coal miners. They went to the fishermen. They went to the folks mending their nets. And they said, hey, let's follow Jesus together. Perhaps, as we think about our church, perhaps preaching to the people working in the mines in Viburnum might not be the best option for us. But I wonder in what ways we might spread the message of Jesus Christ to those who wouldn't be caught dead in a church. That Jesus Christ, how do we go to those and say to others outside this building that Jesus comes to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to free the captive, to recover the sight of the blind, to give give liberty to those who are bruised, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I wonder how we take that beautiful message into the community, into the neighborhoods. There was a time, you know, when people just went to church (laughs) because that's just what you do, right? There was a time in American history that if you wanted to secure a bank loan, I'm not making this up, if you wanted to secure a bank loan, it was required that you first procure a character reference from your pastor. Some of you would not have a mortgage right now. (laughs) But those days are long gone, right? Others are simply not going to attend church just because this building exists. The mission that Jesus called us to is to make disciples of all the world. Now that is a bold statement, Jesus. Perhaps before we tackle the world, What if we just start with our neighborhood, with Farmington? Here at this church, we talk about disciples of Jesus Christ, right? Disciples are people, followers of of Jesus who love God through acts of worship and devotion and love neighbor through acts of justice and compassion. You've heard me say that ad nauseum, right? Worship, devotion, justice, and compassion, loving God, loving neighbor. If we're going to love our neighbor then we have to go to our neighbor because they're not going to show up in this building just because it's here, right? No matter how beautiful it may be. We're a healthy congregation at this church, right? We're a growing church. We've got a lot of young families and kids. And by United Methodist standards, we're a very healthy congregation. What are the strengths of this congregation? And what are the needs of the community around us? And how might the Holy Spirit cause those two things to meet up? We're doing some of this, of course, right? You all, everybody in here could probably name some of the things that we're doing where we're taking the church out into the community. It's kind of Chris's forte, right? Taking the church out into the community. But in what ways might we take the church into the world out into the neighborhood, out into the town. Um, There's another famous Methodist story. So there was an Anglican bishop, a Church of England bishop, that thought that John Wesley was annoying and that he was nuts. Um, He probably was. Um, And he told them that he could not preach in his hometown church in Epworth, England. Said, sorry, you are not welcomed in that pulpit. 
And so John Wesley went just outside of, I mean, just right outside of the church and stood on his father's tomb because the family owned the tomb and not the church. And then he began to preach from the tomb, said, I don't need permission to preach in this parish, scoffed Wesley. The world is my parish. The world is my parish. If this church building ceased to exist, the call to follow Jesus would remain the same. If our finances dried up, if the building crumbled and we were left with nothing, we'd figure out a way to meet up anyway. We'd figure out a way, we'd meet in the park if we had to, and we would be the church. Because Jesus came to us and said, follow me. We are followers of Christ, and our mission is not this building. Our mission is the world. We take Jesus to the world, or at least somewhere between Karsh and Columbia, right? Here we are at the beginning of a new year. And Jesus is coming and calling us to make fishers of men and women, to commit ourselves to the wild and unpredictable work of following Jesus and going to others and inviting them to do the same. We go to our neighbors because Jesus died for your neighbor, which is something you and your neighbor have in common. Jesus died for your neighbor. So let's follow Jesus into the world. Let's fish for people. Let's follow Jesus, no matter how wild and unimaginable it may seem. And let's submit ourselves. Let's submit to be more vile. For the world is our parish. Amen. As a forgiven and reconciled people, we're going to give of our tithes and our offerings today. Um, know that you can give to the church in one of three ways. You can text your offering to 73256 um, and then put in the message, Memorial UMC, one word and the amount you want to give. You can go to our website, memorialumc.church, and click on the Give tab, or you can give in the offering plate as it's passed around today. As we collect of our offerings, giving of ourselves to God, Let's stand as we continue to sing praises to the living God.
we enter into our prayers of the people, we want to lift up uh, a few things. First, uh, each week we send out an email, not only with the list of things going on here at Memorial, but at the bottom is our prayer list. Uh, so you can submit items to that prayer list by either emailing Amy or putting uh, one of the connect cards or something in the offering plate and letting us know. Uh, but also, if you're not receiving that email and you want to join in prayer uh, around the things that we are praying together for, you can let us know. Again, let Amy know. She'll add you to that email list. Uh, we may be basking in the heat this week. Uh, I missed our two weeks of coat worship, but uh, a reminder that there are many who live out in these elements, uh, particularly as we have another round of, of snow and some worse weather coming in. Uh, there are people for whom uh, they have no shelter. And so be in prayer for those who find themselves uh, homeless or living out in the elements. Also, we don't typically lift up specific issues going on uh, with members of our church, but uh, we feel this one's important. Uh, if you know the Howard family, uh, Dolores works in our <laughs> office, and Jim is on the trustees. They're, they're very involved here. Uh, their daughter, Jennifer, Jennifer Vaughn, is having uh, her transplant this week. She's been waiting for a long time, uh, and so we are joining them in prayer that it goes successfully uh, and that she has a long life with uh, her new kidney. Thank you. Um, so just a reminder that's happening. Let us pray together. God, we come before you a thankful people. Thankful for all the ways that you have blessed us, the ways that you have called us to serve you, and the ways that you move us into this world. God, as we see people, may we not see them just as another person, but as your child as someone in need of hope and healing, and help us to bring that to them. God, we pray for those who find themselves on the streets or in the parks, in need of warmth, in need of food, in need of comfort. Be with them, especially this week, as some potential weather moves through. And God, we lift up Jennifer, we lift up the whole family, Nick and Jim and Dolores, and we ask that you be with the doctors and the nurses and the whole staff, as she receives her new kidney. We pray that it would go well, that she would heal, and that she would have a long life spent praising and serving you. God, we are a thankful people, but we know that there are many who are in need of hope and healing, whether they are lonely or hurt or sick. And so we ask that you would use us to minister to them, to bring them peace and comfort. Together we pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. journey I get lost in my mistakes what looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength my story isn't over my story's just begun fear you won't define me cause that's what my father does no fear you won't define me cause that's what my father does Ooh.
announcements as we send you out this week. Uh, first, tomorrow night, United Methodist Men will meet here in the small dining room uh, for some fellowship, a meal, a program. We invite uh, any men are welcome, uh, so we invite you to join us uh, and, and be there tomorrow night. Also, Thursday, this Thursday, is our next pub theology. Uh, so if you haven't been to one of those, what that is is we meet at 102 Tap House, and we talk about some current issues and how they intersect with our faith. Uh, so it's a shared meal, a drink if you'd like one, and uh, we engage together. If you are planning to come, let me know or let the office know just so we can have the right number on the reservation and they know to expect us and have us set up. Uh, also, this Saturday, we are having our best chili fundraiser for the missions team. That's also raised money for many of the things that we do out in this community, uh, in Farmington and beyond. And so we invite you to come Saturday from 4 to 6. You don't need to sign up to come and eat and enjoy the time, but if you're planning to compete in the chili uh, competition, then we ask you to go on Realm and sign up just so we know how many to expect. Thank you very much, Pastor Chris. Um, one thing else I wanted to add, um, as I mentioned last week, next week we are officially kicking off our capital campaign uh, to raise money for the remodeling of our children's wing um, upstairs. I'm really excited about it. Um, you'll go to the steps and you'll follow this river that leads to the castle and the castle room for our kids of the kingdom. Um, there'll be all kinds of, you know, fun play equipment and things. We're also adding some security things to uh, upstairs, some doors some, uh, where we'll be able to check your kids in and do things a little bit differently there. So all important things. This has been something that's been at the top of Memorial's priority list for a really long time. Um, but we've had other things that have kept us from being able to do it. So now we're finally doing, we'll be raising it. It's going to be about a $250,000 project. So it's um, a real major capital campaign that we'll be raising funds for throughout the year. Um, so just to let you know that you'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. Um, but kickoff for that officially begins next week. All right, um, where's the Bible? I want to conclude our time together. Um, with Matthew 28. You'll know this as the Great Commission. This is the words of Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go forth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.